See, this camera ain't looking right, man. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. This is uh, Daoud Kam Hanasha'a, which just means beloved, rise, lift up. One of the instructors here at RPK Resurrection Prophecy Kingdom, where we study resurrection, prophecy, and kingdom. So, I just want to put to rest real fast the um, is black Hebrew Israelite doctrine that they're going to own slaves uh, in the kingdom. So, with that being said, let's get right into it. So, this is their faith. This is one of the favorite verses, uh, two verses. This is regarding prophecy, which is really their uh, the back Hebrew Israelites. It's the weak point of their doctrine is prophecy. So, this is you know what they teach. I know because I used to teach it and I've been taught it, but we're going to go to Isaiah, right? Uh, 14, 1 and 2. They love this. And it says, For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land and the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob and the people shall take them and bring them to their place and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids and they shall take them captives whose captives they were and they shall rule over their oppressors so you know we're taught well they're taught that that's talking about um, you know present day Israelites taking other nations into captivity and ruling over them you know, it clearly says servants and handmaids, but they're going to twist that to say slaves. And then they want to torture them, do un unrighteous acts in heaven where there is no unrighteousness. Now, there's a reason why. For instance, if I was to say to you, you, you can say this to any black Hebrew Israelite, most of them, and say, you know, who, who is that prophecy against? They're going to say the white man. I'm going to say, well, if you say, well, where does that prophecy start? Because that's clearly not, you know, no prophecy starts off for the Lord will, will have mercy on Jacob. And nine out, of, nine out of ten of them just won't know. They have no idea where it starts. And this is because they don't really read the Bible. What they have is a list of uh, scriptures that they call precepts, which is really, it's really a cut book. That, that's, that's what they call it. That's, when, I, when I was with it, they called it a cut book. Some people call it a, a welcome home package. This is full of you know, random scriptures that are out of context that you can use as an Israelite you know, to fool people that you, know, that you know what you're talking about when you really don't. I want to prove that right now. So, this prophecy actually starts in Isaiah 13. Now, you would figure, right, if, if for them to use 14 and 1 and 2 so much, I've Sooner or later, you will see 13 come up because that's where it starts. But they never say that. And there's a reason why. It's because they know that if you go back to where this prophecy starts, it's going to crush it. It's going to kill that doctrine, crush their dreams and hopes, and will expose them. I honestly don't understand why they even do that. Because no matter how much the doctrine gets exposed or crushed, there's certain people still plugged into that matrix there where they just, you know, it doesn't matter. No, this, this is going to happen. And it's going to happen in my lifetime. That's what they really believe. So, whatever. But anyway, let's go to uh, Isaiah 13 where this prophecy actually starts so we can see, you know, who this is uh, being prophesied against. It's 13 and 1. We're going to go through 13, 1 through 3. Let's go. The burden of Babylon which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. So we can know, you know, just by just by this alone, that this is a, a prophecy against Babylon, literal Babylon. That's just by the time this was written, because it was still standing when this was written. Literal Babylon. That's what the prophecy is against. Okay, it's not against the United States. But let's continue. Verse 2. Lift ye up a banner upon a high upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, 
shake the hand that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. So we see in verse 3 that he has commanded sanctified ones. If you don't know what sanctified means, it just means they're set apart. Set apart ones, right? So we got, I lifted up my, um, I commanded my sanctified ones. Those same sanct sanctified ones are my mighty ones for my anger. And they actually rejoice in his highness. This is not talking about no Israelite. How do we know this? Well, let's go, before I show you that, let's just go to 13 so we can get a little more context about what's going on here. So, so far we see that it's, uh, so far we see this is against Babylon, right? Let's go to 13. Behold, I will stir up the meats against them which shall not regard silver as for gold, they shall not delight in it. So we know already that the people that are going to lift this banner up, the sanctified ones, the ones he reserved for his anger, and are going to carry out this burden against Babylon are the Medes, all right, the Medi, the Medial Persians. Okay, that's who's going to carry it out, right? So, so far, like I said, we've got prophecy against Babylon. we got who's doing it is the Medes. Let's see who this meat is. We can simply go to Isaiah 45. This is not difficult. This is going to be a quick lesson. This is not difficult. Man. This is simple. Isaiah 45. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, anointed, sanctified, same thing, his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, and I will lose the loins of kings to upon before him the two leave, two leave gates and the gates shall not be shut. So we can see this um, Mede is Cyrus, right? So Cyrus is the one who is going to fulfill Isaiah 14, 1 and 2. This is who was talking about, Cyrus. Now, I can go a little more down the succession lines of the um, Persians or the Medes because, you know, you have one ruler, then you know the sun it takes over. Then the sun, the sun. So you know, you, you know, you go down the line further. You can get the Darius, um, who, who who was controlling it too. Who was no, who was, who was conquering um, conquering Babylon too. We can see that in Daniel 5, 30 and thirty one, right? So it says, "In that night was Belshazzar." If you didn't know Belshazzar, that's a Babylonian king. In the night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom being about three score and two years old. Okay? So, I'm already showing y'all right now. Isaiah 14 is against Babylon. The Medes, right? The Medes, those are the ones who carry it out, right? What Mede? It's Cyrus. So, so far, I've taken care of who's doing this, okay? Darius took the Israelites from Babylon and took them back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Now, I had this a couple people when I bring this out. They're saying, yeah, that's true. So I'll get them to agree with this much. Mind you, they never even seen it yet. They were saying the Israelites, they ain't even seen 13 yet. But when I bring that out, they say, yeah, you're right. But when do we, and they say it confidently too, I mean confident. We never had slaves in our own land. We're well, not slaves. We never had servants in our own land. We never ruled over our persons in our own land. Show me one verse in the Bible that says we had servants in our own land. That's just letting me know you don't read the Bible, man. Do you really think I would be saying this if I couldn't back it up? You would think that because that's what you do. But that's not what I do. And that's not what we do at RPK. That shit don't fly. So when I say they had servants and handmaids... They had him, and I'm going to show you right now. So we know that Nehemiah, right? He was one of the people brought back from Babylon, helped build back the temple. Let's see what he says. He says in uh, verse, he says in chapter Nehemiah, chapter 4, verse 16, And it came to pass, and it, and it came to pass from that time forth, that the half of my servants wrought in the work, and the other half of them held both spears and it held both the spears, the shields, and the bows, and the harbor, harbor guns, 
and the rulers were behind all of the house of Judah. So we have here clearly Nehemiah, somebody that was brought back by Cyrus to Jerusalem. Why he's building up the wall, he's letting us know he has servants. All right, he has servants. There goes your servants. Right, there goes your Isaiah 14 and 2. There go the servants. He's ruling over the he's ruling over uh his oppressors. And he, he has taken captive whose captains he was. But let's go a little further. If that wasn't enough for you, we can go to uh, we can go to Nehemiah 4 and 23, where he says, So neither I, nor my brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saying that everyone put them off for washing. Right? So we see he's making three distinctions here, right? First one he says, So neither I, that's himself, nor my brethren. Y'all love that word brethren, right? It's isolating it to Israelites, right? So cool. So they go to Israelites, my brethren, nor my servants. So we know. So because some people like to say, oh, no, you know that those those servants were, were Israelites. Obviously, they were not Israelites because he just said, nor my brethren, one distinction, nor my servants, another distinction. You see what I'm saying? So there, here's Nehemiah again telling you he has uh, servants, right? Then they are not no Israelites. He's ruling over his oppressors, right? Clear as day. That's not enough for you. He says it a third time. He says it two more times. But let's go to the third time. Isaiah 5, no, sorry, Nehemiah 5, 16. Yea, also I continued in the work of this wall, neither brought we any land, and all my servants were gathered thither unto the work. So here he's saying he got servants again. But y'all still think you're going to have some slaves in heaven. It's not talking about that. Nehemiah is telling you who these servants are, right? He's telling you. He's showing you this. And I got one more for y'all, which is Nehemiah 13 and 19, where he says, And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that, and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants set I at the gates that, th that there should be no burden brought in on the Sabbath day, right? So he got servants on, he got servants outside the gates to keep other nations from coming and trying to sell us goods on a Sabbath day, right? So again, he's got servants. But here's the the uh, the kicker and the real nail in the nail in the coffin. We can go to Ezra. As a matter of fact, one second. Ah, uh, okay. Cool. Matter of fact, I got it, got it on my Bible right now. I know I had this out for some reason. We can go to Ezra, right? So let's get some context on, on, on Ezra, what's happening here, right? It's Ezra 1. It's gonna give like, I might give like two verses, maybe maybe one, two. Now in the first year, this is Ezra 1. This is Ezra 1, right? Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of the stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, right? And this is what Cyrus said. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all kingdoms on the earth and have charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Right? So we see Cyrus making this decree, right, in Ezra. We all already showed you that he brought the Israelites out of Babylon back to Jerusalem. This is when it's happening. So now he's giving the orders for them to rebuild the temple, right? So I'm just giving you the context of what's happening. This is Israelites under Cyrus. They're being brought back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. So that's the context. That's the context. So let's go a little deeper with that and go to Ezra 2, right? Verse 64 through 65. And this is really the last verse I got for y'all. But it's going to show you that the Isaiah 14 and 2 was fulfilled. Ezra 2, 64 through 65. The whole congregation together was 40 and 2,303 score. So we know this is talking about the congregation, right? So far, they made a distinction. These are Israelites. Verse 65, beside their servants and their maids, of whom there were seven of, of whom there were seven thousand three hundred and thirty and seven, 
and there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. That is clear as day, right? These are these are Israelites under Cyrus, right? Cyrus is telling them to build the build the temple up. They're giving you a count of two different sets of people, the congregation, right? And then their servants and mates. So to sum it up, let's just go back to Isaiah 14 and 1 and 2, where this, which is it's in the middle of the prophecy. And this is what it is. For the Lord shall have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land and the strangers. No, no, and set them in their own land. Let me just stop there. So we are already showed you that Cyrus is the one that did that. The, the, that's the sanctified one, that's his anointed one, that's the one he stirred, that's the spirit he stirred up to take down Babylon and bring his people back to Jerusalem, right? So that's that part. And the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. This is Cyrus, again, taking the, taking the people back, because, you know, wherever Israel went, you know, they still had their God. They still knew. And the people knew. So some of those people would, would cleave to them. Naturally, just, just like it is now. Some people, you know, they're going to hang on to them. They're going to cleave to them. You know what I'm saying? So that's what he's talking about there. And let's go to two. And the people shall take them bring and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives whose captives they were. And they shall rule over their oppressors. Okay, so I, I've given it to you right there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I got that prophecy completely fulfilled. I just showed you. Clear as day. If you still believe that there's somebody going to come out the sky. Cause listen, this is this is what you're saying. This is what you're... This, I, I'm not even going to go that far right into the, the slaves yet. But you got to think about this with common logic. This is what you're saying. You need somebody to come down in a flying saucer to beam you up, take you over to Jerusalem, and sit you down there. A spaceship. You can take a plane. You can do that with a plane, man. You can do that with an airplane. So you need a spaceship to do it? Okay, that's, that's just one common sense issue. But as far as the servants and handmaids and the slaves, if you still don't see that this prophecy is fulfilled after what I just showed you, it just means you're disingenuous. You don't, you're not really interested in the Bible. You're not really interested in God. You're more interested in getting some kind of retribution or reparations or some type of vengeance on a people, on a present day people that did nothing to you. They're just reaping the fruits of, of their, uh, you know, their forefathers. But you want to take them who are innocent, right? And you want to deal with them unrighteously. This is because you have uh, a dark heart. You're, 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 um, it's a reaction to pain. First comes pain, then the natural response is going to be anger. But this is not the way, this is not the way you should be doing it. So, once again, man, like I said, this is a quick lesson. This is Daoud Kam Hanasha'a from RPK. I've just clearly showed you that Isaiah. 14 and 1, which is really Isaiah 13, that's where it starts at. It has already be, been fulfilled. Now, like on all my other videos, if you feel like I'm wrong, right, or any scripture that you call a precept, it's not a precept, it's a scripture, that I brought out is wrong, or I'm out of context, or that's not what it is, feel free to jump on here and prove me wrong. But like I said in my last video, I'm going to give you the same warning. This, this school that I teach with is called Resurrection Prophecy. That's what I'm giving you now in Kingdom. If you don't study prophecy, like most black Hebrew Israelites simply do not, and you come on my post, I'm not sparing you. I'm going to make you look silly because you bought it. But once again, this is uh, Daoud Kamanasha, ah, man. I'm not making that up. RPK, Resurrection Prophecy Kingdom. All this is fulfilled. We are already in the kingdom, okay? We go off the first century Jews, uh, the first century Jews interpretation of scripture, not y'all's, which started in 1969. I'm not making that up. You can ask any 
black Hebrew Israelite. When did when did this start? 1969. All right, man, I'm holla at y'all. RPK.